Good evening, everybody. Good evening, welcome. Thank you all for coming. My name is Bob Adakovic. I am the acting director of the UB Real Estate and Economic Development Program. Uh, for those of you who do not know about the REED program, it is Maryland's only undergraduate program in real estate. Uh, our, a number of our alumni are here tonight and they have gone on to do great things in going to grad school and starting businesses and developing projects. So we're very happy uh, about the REED program and about Lessons from Legends. This is now our seventh in the Lessons from Legends in Real Estate series, uh, featuring Donald and Thibaut Mannequin. You'll hear more about them in just a second. Uh, what I'd like to do now is say thank you to all of our sponsors. You can see them flying across the screen here. They are on the backs of your programs. I'd like to list them all out, but we only have the room for a short period of time. Uh, so. Thank you, everybody, on the sponsorship list for your support of the Reed program and the MSB. Can we have a round of applause for our sponsors, please? <laughs> and of course, none of this would happen without the hard and tireless work of the unsung heroes within the Reed program. So I just want to call out a few people who, without their diligence and persistence, we would all not be here today, and we would not have the great food and the great amount of turnout. So I'd like to recognize Tashi Jelani, Danielle Giles, who was responsible for doing most of this stuff, and as luck has it, she can't be here tonight. Uh, Don Hobbs and Kate Crimmins. And also, I'd like to thank members of the Reed Program Advisory Board who helped us pull all this together. They were making phone calls. They were running around buying ribbons and tablecloths and things of that sort. So thank you very much to Ann Angel, Donna Sturdivant, Josh Neiman, Dave Lassus, and Kathleen Flynn. Uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to a man who really needs no introduction around these parts. He's gonna give you some opening remarks and tell you a lot about a good, all the good things that UB is doing. Please welcome President Kurt Schmoke. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to see you all here. Thank you very much. Uh, Bob gave me an, an opening that I won't take, which is to tell you all the good things going on uh, here. You know, if I get a university president talking about all the good things at the university, uh, for those of you who have a long memory, it would be like uh, asking the author of Roots, uh, how's your family? You know, you can kind of go on for episodes and episodes. And for you young people, ask your parents about it. Uh, I, I just want to thank you all very much. You know, we, we do believe that ours is one of the uh, hidden jewels in the university uh, system of Maryland. Uh, we started in 1925 as a merger of a night law school and a night business school, and we've always had a very much a career orientation, and you'll see uh, all around the university our logo, which says knowledge that works. And what we really mean by that is that we're bringing together a lot of people, great uh, faculty, great re research, but focused in on making sure that people, when they leave here, are able not only to go to graduate school, but enter the world of work uh, really well prepared. We want to thank uh, our legends tonight. And I said to one of them, you're a bit young, Thibault, to be a legend. <laughs> but Don, uh, you, you uh, certainly have a legacy there and the partnership that you all have developed has uh, uh, benefited this community greatly and I know you're just getting going so but it's my pleasure really tonight not only to thank uh, each and every one of you and also to let you know our Dean of the, the business school uh, Murray DL is uh, out on a, um, a trip I think he's in Asia and he's in Asia uh, now and um, so I, I know he would have greeted you but it's really my uh, particular pleasure uh, to introduce uh, someone you're talking like she needs no introduction, but a, uh, a, a great friend of the university, a, a businesswoman, a longtime uh, legislator, a very uh, a creative uh, public uh, official, a mayor who's doing just outstanding work in uh, moving the uh, community forward. And I certainly had the pleasure as the 46th mayor to introduce the 50th mayor of Baltimore, the Honorable Catherine Pugh. <laughs> I don't think it gets much better than that. Thank you, Kurt. 
Um, you know, I get to work with so many people, and he is absolutely one of them. In fact, I consider him one of my advisors, and he may get a call early in the morning or late at night, and he always answers the call, so thank you again. I am so honored to be here with these two so-called legends, one not so, um, as, uh, the, as the mayor said, the president said, I don't know if we count you, Tebow, as a legend, um, but as a partnership, I guess we can consider that in terms of your legacy. In 2006, many of you know that Donald and Tebow Mannequin founded Seawall Development, a Baltimore-based firm focused on redeveloping historic buildings into mixed-use projects. And I'm telling you, if you've not seen them, you can walk all around just in this community, a few. And if you go a few blocks over, and I'll talk a little bit about it, the Baltimore Design School. I just want to congratulate this father and son team on the rewards of leading just such a tremendous organization that creates trends for so many of us to follow. They have preserved some of our historical buildings throughout the city, but more importantly, they've turned them into entities that are just continue to give back to our city. Seawall Development Company has shown ingenuity and innovation, thinking and techniques to adapt and reuse vacant structures in Baltimore City to create housing, workspaces, and places to gather and recreate for the city's teachers and nonprofit providers. Now, it's been a decade, and Seawall's multiple efforts, the father and son team, they're still building. The company has completed and are pursuing development of over 200 million of creative, adaptive reuse projects in Baltimore and in Philadelphia, my hometown. The mannequins have always been generous with their time and resources, giving back to so many. They share what they've learned, especially with the citizens of Baltimore. Donald Mannequin spent two years being an advisor to our CEO of the Baltimore City Public School System. I believe that's probably why he's so passionate about our schools and what we're doing to develop them and enhance them in our city. This is something we both share in common, as I am the founder of the Baltimore Design School. And I can tell you that good ideas become great ideas when you infuse them with others. And having worked so closely with Fred Lazarus and, and Steve, I think you all really put together something that many Baltimoreans can be proud of. The built environment is not simply a building. Now, it's not just about building bridges and roads, but the potential to solve real world problems through design. And that's really the premises on which we found at the Baltimore Design School. Because as I think about the young people who will walk through the, those doors, just by what they see in terms of that building, I look at them as the designers of the future. Congratulations, Donald. Congratulations, Tebow. And thank you for your commitment to Baltimore. I'm so excited about the work that you've done, but I'm more excited about the work that you will do in the future. So I have the distinct honor, along with our honorable president, to present this great award, a legendary trophy, and um, to the both of them, boy, they look like they were still working, don't they? Give them a big round of applause. Come on. <laughs> Madam Mayor, Mr. President, thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, now to the main event. Uh, Donald and Tebow Mannequin are the guests of honor for our seventh lessons from Legends. And as they are getting their uh, mics turned on, I'll read you a brief bio. Uh, Donald has been in the business, the real estate business, for 40 plus years. Uh, he has been a teacher at Johns Hopkins and at MIT. In fact, that's where I first met Donald. He was a teacher in the Hopkins real estate program, and he was my teacher way back in 1990-something or other. Um, hard to remember when. The internet hadn't really been invented yet, and all the wheels were square. Um, but he was a fantastic teacher, and since then we've kept in contact. Uh, he started with the Mannequin Corporation. His father's firm started in the mid-1970s, and 
through 20 plus years at Mannequin Corp, or maybe even longer than that, built several million square feet of office and industrial and retail space around the Baltimore region. Um, as the mayor said, he has served as a as interim or as the CEO, COO of Baltimore City Public Schools in charge of their facilities, and remains involved with a number of charitable organizations such as Teach for America, Experience Corps, TIA, Sophia, and Building Educated Leaders for Life. Tebow is a Baltimore native. Uh, he started his career with the United Way um, abroad and then worked here in Maryland. He is the founder of uh, Peace Players, which has grown into a $3 million a year organization, bringing uh, disaffected youth from war-torn regions together through uh, productive dialogue through the sport of basketball, which is particularly appropriate now that we are in the, near the end of March Madness. Seawall Development was the brainchild of both of these men. They started this in 2006. The mayor's already given you a lot of the background of Seawall. Um, it really is a new model for doing development. Uh, this was a place where social entrepreneurship could work to make neighborhoods better places. They have stuck to their guns. They've done a lot of good things. A lot of their projects, like Union Mill and Miller's Court, are developed into reduced cost housing for teachers, primarily from Teach for America. There are homes for nonprofit businesses involved in teaching. Uh, their projects, 200 million worth and counting, uh, have won numerous awards, including President Obama's Champion for Change and the ULI Wavemakers Awards. There are many others. And like I said, we only have the room for a short period of time. I can't read them all. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn the stage over to Donald and Tebow Mannequin. Gentlemen, take it away. Can everybody hear us? Yeah. Good evening. How are you guys doing? Yeah. This is awesome. Um, I get the honor of going first. I totally agree with the mayor, both mayors that uh, I have no business on the stage. So <laughs> I, am, I, am, I am here somewhat uh, guilt by association, I think, which in this situation I take. Uh, thank you to UB. Thank you to Bob. Thank you for, for hosting us here. Um, we're going to do this a little bit like StoryCorps. If anybody's seen the NPR piece. We're just going to chat. Uh, uh, it's a little bit how Seawall came to be. Um, and uh, every few days, uh, we get to, to sit down and have similar conversations. So we're going to get invite you into our living room. So uh, bear with us with that format. I, I want to start by telling you how much I love you. you can roll out. <laughs> um, you've, uh, you've never t taught me a single lesson. Um, by telling me, you've taught all of us lessons just by being and by doing, and that's the hardest way to lead, and uh, it's, uh, it describes you to a T, so uh, I love you, thank you. Um, um, tell us, tell me, tell us about how, what it was like growing up in the uh, family real estate business. First of all, let me say that the relationship with the brothers are so cool, um, and I can't imagine Is that better? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. See how much he's teaching me all along? <laughs> uh, I wanted to start this conversation by the ultimate legacy of legends is really your grandfather, who, as you, so as you were so articulate in describing, is, may have been the greatest professor that I could have ever experienced, because he never taught us, you, me, the grandchildren, um, that through sitting down in a lecture, it was always by his actions. Um, I mean, I, there wasn't any portion of his life that wasn't relationship driven, that wasn't full of humility, um, wasn't about exceeding expectations, and wasn't about ex just accepting everybody for who they were. And so if those pieces, I think, have been instrumental for all the work that we've done, whether it's been at Mannequin, that the school system, with playing for peace, at Seawall, it's always been focused on the we, the we side of life and not on the me side of life. And so I'm you know, thrilled to have him s sitting here next to us, um, again, reaping the benefit of what he's uh, passed on to us. Um, in terms of the family business, it was 25 years that I just 
I couldn't wait to get out of bed in the morning. I mean, we followed Jim Rouse to Columbia um, and his vision for what really cities could, could be like. And so we went out there as pioneers in the early 70s and began developing single-story flex R&D buildings. Um, uh, what made them really special is that companies could take a little bit of space and then ultimately grow. So it wasn't about, never about the transaction. It was always about the relationship because these companies aspired to be something larger and we were, wanted to be there for them. So this notion of real estate as a transaction never never crossed our minds. It was always about the relationship that you have with these folks. I think the other pieces that stood out is that the business typically was in silos. There was a development group, there was a leasing group, there was a construction group, there was a property management group. All had the right intentions, but they never really talked to each other. And so we made the decision when we built the Columbia through the help of Ray Blank, who was a uh, wonderful uh, consultant to us, is that we were gonna work in teams. And the teams were all interconnected. They had all the functions of real estate development, construction, administration, property management. But they weren't in silos. They really were interconnected. And the center of that universe was the tenant in the building. And so that was never about whether it was going to be a commission driven there. It was really about how everybody was the focus of, of um, of the folks that we actually represented, which were the tenants who occupied the buildings. The other piece that I thought was really incredibly helpful for me is that for my probably the first three or four years I was in Columbia, I lived in Mount Washington and was driving to, um, to Columbia. And then I would, could share with you some stories of guilt because I'd get up early in the morning and I'd go to work and I'd come back after the kids went to sleep and did it the next day. And so I'd have, somewhere in the middle of the afternoon on the third day, I'd have this pang of guilt I'd put down whatever, and I'd drive all the way across the park school to have lunch with the kids. And then I'd get back in the car and go do this, go this all over again. So there was that piece. But the, the, one of the great pieces that stood out for me was that when I got to Columbia, I thought Howard County was in Columbia. I didn't realize it was the other way around. And so when I had a geographic area that was sort of 108 on the north and 32 on the south and downtown Columbia and on the, on the west and 995, and that was my, and I could go to, I could get to Ellicott City. So I really thought there was something else other than Columbia, I'd get to Ellicott City. And so I went through the Leadership Howard County program and it just, it was a game changer for me because I got this opportunity to see the county and those pieces that were so important to the county and how as an organization we could play a role in the success of, of Howard County. So, um, I mean, those 25 years were just, spectacular, uh, I, the people that we met, the opportunities to connect with people were really quite, quite special. This is a little bit of a kid. Isn't there a story about an ice cream truck? I think that yeah, no, no, no we, had, we, we, we set up an ice cream truck on really hot days and we would travel around Who's all the- we? Who set up the ice cream truck? The, the folks in Columbia, we all, we, all, we all made a decision about sort of this total tenant satisfaction and what we could do to sort of, give the tenants something like to get out of their office space. And so we hired a good humor truck and we literally went around with a good humor truck to all the tenants and offered everybody ice cream on those hot summer days. And Were you driving the truck? No, I probably, <laughs> I, I was eating the ice cream with everybody for, for sure. So, so and I'm just gonna change it now. And um, so Thibaut spent, had spent six years in South Africa, Ireland, uh, Middle East, and Cyprus building this incredible program uh, that both Brigitte and I got a chance to see twice. And I mean, I could go on and talk about this, but so you made this decision, you graduate from Lehigh University and take a piece with the United Way. Tell us how this whole playing for peace thing got started and what's, what stands out for you. Yeah, so, so uh, the, the idea was that we could go to the war-torn countries so Sports to get kids from two sides of the conflict, meet each other, finding common ground, and hopefully becoming friends. And we had no idea what we were doing. We basically raised twenty thousand dollars from friends and family, which was just barely enough to get on a plane to Durban, South Africa, just after apartheid. We wanted to get white kids and black kids to play moves together, um, and we got swept up in an enormous movement. Um, I think the one big lesson that came from the whole thing is that the most powerful thing in the world is an idea whose time has come. And that these ideas that we work on, if we're lucky enough in our lives to 
be given the opportunity to help bring an idea to, uh, into, into the world. They're not our ideas. They don't belong to us. They belong to the universe. And our role is to be kind of quietly behind the scenes helping these great ideas come to life. And when we do that, we give everybody this once in a lifetime opportunity to be a part of something larger than themselves. It's not about a person and their, and their, and their, and their mission. It's about this larger cause. So we're three months into our program in South Africa. We had $8,000 left uh, in the bank, and we're just about out of money. And we get a call from Nelson Mandela. Um, and he says, have you guys seen the movie Invictus? Um, uh, you know, he understood the power of sports tonight. And he says, guys, uh, what do you need? I'm all in. I want to become your largest sponsor. So we went from, <laughs> I think at the time it was you with $500. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we went from you know, three chumps overnight to instantaneous credibility. Our program in South Africa grew to a staff of 200. Um, we started to raise millions of dollars with the Mandela name behind us. Um, we are in 22 countries across the world at this point. Um, and have worked with close to 100,000 kids. Um, and it took off because of a couple things. One is um, that we realized that this idea of Sports Tonight wasn't ours, that it always existed. It was on the tip of the universe's tongue. And we built it from the inside out, where everybody involved, from the end user, the kids and the coaches, to the community, to the schools, and the, and the parents, and the, and the municipalities, to the team, uh, for your sponsors and your donors and everybody, everybody felt like they were part of something larger than themselves. Um, and it became a movement. Um, and you know, we learned there that we have to be in the business of starting movements. We can't be in the business of building a product, um, building a building. Um, everything that we do has to be about <clears throat> helping people become a part of something larger than themselves. And if you can get to that point, there's no stopping that idea. Right. Um, uh, you uh, uh, had an awesome 25 years uh, with Manic and helping the family business grow. But you got a call one day and <laughs> took a little bit of a different uh, yeah. career path. Can you, right. can you tell us about it? So um, the company in 2000 made a decision to sell um, half of its operating company and three quarters of the real estate that had been developed. And, I'd always had this interest in education. Uh, it's interestingly enough, um, my understanding of real estate was through my father and listening to him and growing up with him, but I never thought I had the capacity to be in the business. I never thought I had the technical skills. And then I spent the summer between the summer before graduation um, with the company and then found that it really had nothing to do with the technical skills because you could learn those things. And if you didn't know them, you could find somebody in the company that knew them. Uh, but it was really about this concept of developing relationships and having sort of grown up with a father who was uh, excellent at that piece and shared those experiences with us by his actions made it easier for me to make this decision. So going into the business just it was just an exceptional opportunity. But 25 years later, the father and uncle at 86 and 83 sort of wanted to go into the sunset free and clear of any company obligations company grew. When I got there in 75, there were 15 of us, and the majority of us had some relationship to the last name. And then when I left in 2000, there were 140 folks in the company. Um, and so, and they all, and the, the senior management team wanted a piece of the action. And so I figured this was an opportunity for me to go do some things that I had not had the opportunity to do, only by sort of either reading about it or sitting on boards. and. Um, so we started a small foundation that supported school teachers in the rural counties of Western Maryland with mini grants to help them do things with their students that they couldn't find funding for typically. And in some cases, those folks in the, in the rural counties of Western Maryland, Garrett and Allegheny, had never been to the Chesapeake Bay. And so we were able to sponsor those kinds of trips. And then we were on vacation as a family up in Maine, and Bill Struver calls. And I, the audience has got to know who this guy is. <laughs> And so, you know, he's not sort of calm and deliberate about how he delivers his message. You can see it with his hands up in the air, and he's talking. He says, look, I've got a great opportunity for you. And I said, what's that? He says, I want you to come and be the chief operating officer for the school system. I said, what? <laughs> so, um, you know, I said, look, you know, he goes through this. You know, there you, get, you can't interrupt him because he's, and he doesn't breathe when he talks. He just, <laughs> just all comes out. I know, you know, and so I said to him, look, I, this is not for the faint of heart. I need to go and think about this. And 
So I was thinking, well, the, when I left the company, we were an $11 million company. And when the school system was $850 million, I was saying to myself, this, this, the math of this doesn't work very well. Uh, so I huddled with Brigitte and the kids, and I said, this is like a once in a lifetime opportunity to finally get behind the doors of public education and understand what's going on. And I will share with you, I thought the first 25 years of my life was, business life was great. Those two years at North Avenue were incredibly exceptional, meeting some people who were so focused on really doing the right things for students. Um, it's just, it was extraordinary. Uh, and so for those two years, uh, you can't, you, you don't, you're working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even when you're not there, because there's so many things that are going on, but having the opportunity to bring new people on board, to empower people, for them to feel really responsible for their jobs. There's one absolutely terrific story that talks about connections and relationships that we've established in the community. So there's this absolutely stunning woman who's in charge of logistics, and part of those Okay. Um, so, okay. Uh, so she, one of one of the departments that she runs is um, is uh, um, mail service. So there are 186 schools. All the mail comes into North Avenue, and then it gets distributed to 186 schools. Um, the mail arrives at 10 o'clock in the morning, and everybody comes to work at seven. So there's a three hour gap there, and then so the mail never all gets delivered on schedule because people leave at three o'clock in the afternoon because they got there at seven. And they were, had these paths where they literally would cross each other and not stop at the school that they crossed because there was somebody in somebody else's path. She was just beyond herself and trying to figure out how to make this work. I mean, she was a school teacher, a principal. She came to North Avenue in administration. She had no experience in this piece. And so, and I had no idea, other than the fact I knew how to call FedEx and get the package from me to you the next day. So I sat on the board at the United Way with the guy who ran the UPS operation in Baltimore and called him up and said, look, we got this, like this little situation here. We try to get the mail delivered. He said, no problem, absolutely no problem. The next month he flew in three people from the West Coast who spent a month with her building a business plan so that she could really have something that made a lot of sense. So those kinds of experiences were just exceptional because we were empowering people who really wanted to do something really bold and, and efficient and gave them the tools by which to do it. And it was because of the kinds of connections that you get by serving in the community beyond just the business of, in those days, in, in a real estate development business in, in Columbia. But I'd share with you that I, the, the, the relationships that got built at North Avenue um, uh, the opportunity to see public education from the inside out. Um, it's still, I think, probably the most important economic development engine the city has, is to be able to figure out how to take that preschool student and graduate them 14 years later, really ready for the workforce or post-secondary work. So, so uh, um, when you were wrapping up your time in public education, I was coming back from living overseas. I lived out of a suitcase for six or seven years, living in villages and tribes and huts. <laughs> um, and uh, I wanted to come back and I wanted to pick a city and go all in on it as opposed to bouncing around as much as I had. And I never dreamt of um, coming back to Baltimore and never dreamt of um, coming into the real estate. But you and I were sitting around after dinner one night um, and we started talking about uh, if I could get you to dust off the real estate hat and uh, maybe we would look at starting a, a real estate company together. What was going through your head <laughs> and, and maybe your heart uh, when we started that conversation? Uh, I was trying to think of something cute to say, but, I, but I'm not. I'm going to be as, as I think I was when we started this, this little enterprise. I don't think there's a better honor than have your son come to you and say, will you help me start a business? So I'd... I'll say no to mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's up to you. That's up to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I it, as I said, it's just it's an incredible opportunity to, uh, to take what I think had been given to us by through generations and say that if we're going to do something, it's going to be something different than what we had done, although those 25 years were exceptional. I think the opportunity to 
in, in large part, some of this came from the experiences at the school system and at um, North Avenue, um, is to try to figure out how we can do something that has a greater purpose than just the bricks and sticks of real estate. Um, and so there was an opportunity here to, to say to ourselves, well, so how do we, we'd sit at these, at the end of the Teach for America board members and say, at the board me meetings and say, wouldn't it be great if there was existing residents that to take the mystery out of where to live if you coming into a city that you've never been to before, how do you take the mystery out of where to live, get acclimated to what you're doing, uh, get to know the city of Baltimore and hopefully want to make it your home. Uh, there wasn't anything. So that it was a very daunting task for those Teach for America Corps members and others who were new to the city to come into Baltimore and, and try to find something. And then there were sort of 30 nonprofit organizations um, uh, that were floating around in 30 different locations, paying rent to 30 different landlords, getting no economy of scale. And so we thought there was a, an opportunity to take advantage of that, take advantage of that piece. And so um, I would share with you, so we got connected to a, a building at the corner of Howard and 26th Street. Um, we had no idea what we were doing. And I went because the financing for the stuff we'd done in Columbia was pretty easy. There was a construction loan and a permanent financing, and then you went on with it. And you know, the, but our but our vision was is this wasn't our building. This was a building of the folks that lived in Remington and Charles Village. It was the it was the people that were going to actually inhabit the building. And so we were really thoughtful about like they should be a part of the design team. Uh, they sh as should the community. Um, we learned that the uh, that there were three, two other developers who tried to take on this building, and both of which both of which went to the community and said, "This is what we're doing." And they said, "You're not going to do that." And this is what we're going to do. And this is what. So after two years of litigation, they both sort of left town with their tails between the legs. So we bought this building, and we weren't going to surely make that same mistake that they did. And I think within 24 hours, we were sitting in front of three community associations, giving them a vision for what we wanted. But we said, look, this, this is your building. You are the neighbor to this building. And what we end up doing is going to have the impact on, on you. And so help us do all the right things that make sense. And those relationships, there's one great story. Um, so we would sit on the stoops with the people in the neighborhood. Um, Baltimore's great, famous for these, the stoops. And um, we got a call in the middle of the night um, from the police. Um, or late at night from the police. It says, There's, um, we just arrested somebody who tried to break into the building while it was under construction. Our neighbor saw what was going on with was trying to get into the building and tackled this person <laughs> and sat on him. This is a very big guy, too, I want to say. But it was just because it was, that was the relationship. We, weren't, we didn't want to be guests. We wanted to be neighbors in the community, and that was one of the ways to do it, was to have the community feel like this was their building. And there was a wonderful old lady in the neighborhood who thinks this, who came up to us and said, I think this, that you've really built a wonderful building for me. And I don't think there's a greater honor than that, um, than that piece. And um, so, you know, the sense of building from the inside out really had to do with the folks who were gonna be the residents, the office tenants, and then the neighborhood. I mean, they were, very clear to us in terms of the expectations. One of their big pieces was to have a cafe and they didn't want it to be a Starbucks. And so we scurried all over town to try to find some folks that looked like they li lived in Remington and Charmington's got built. And, um, and it's become not only a great place those teachers get their job a hit when they leave early in the morning, the nonprofits are using it for their lunches and, and seminars, and the neighborhood thinks it's their office. And so we're thrilled with all those pieces. One of the other pieces that uh, you and I talk about all the time is when you build from the inside out, you got the end user, who's the teachers and the nonprofits, right. and then the, um, uh, the community, which are equally as important, and then the team. You know, like we had no idea what we were doing, and when we went out to uh, to, to try to, to to help everybody pull this off, um, we had a 14 million dollar gap between what we, the project could afford to borrow and and what we needed to finish it. And no small problem. And I saw Dave, I saw Dave Rademan and Kirsten Walper and the Gallagher folks here and, and the Resnick and folks. And Resnick, Ira, and uh, and the folks from Enterprise. I don't think Bart's here, but Joe Lasalowski. And you know, we we said we had no idea what they were doing, and they said, well, there's these new market tax credits and these historic tax credits, and I'm sure the city can put up a million bucks and the state of Maryland can pony up if there's a gap. And before you know it, knew it, there was no gap. 
and the phone was almost ringing off the hook to the point that I think people felt left out if they weren't a part of this movement that was being <laughs> created with uh, with, uh, with with this what became known as the Center for Educational Excellence. Right. I would also just pick up on that, that you, it's not possible to do this by yourselves. And so the, the team that got created, I want to talk about the Gallagher and the, and the Resnick folks, there's a, there's a special language that they have when they talk to each other. And, it's, and it isn't for the common folk. <laughs> and, and they make, and, there no, <laughs> and there's no Rosetta Stone that you can go by <laughs> to understand that language. But they were remarkable because they were incredibly bilingual. They could talk to each other in language that, that only the two of them knew. And then they could turn around and talk to, like, talk to us in like in English. <laughs> it, was, it was just, it was really quite spectacular. And, but I, if you think about the number of folks that um, were engaged with the, the project, and we've had this conversation often about this, the unsung heroes. I mean, I, I, when you think about the fact that they were working in a building that's 100 plus years old, that there's not a single window to be found in it, uh, it leaks like a sieve, and there's, you know, the guys are, you know, putting the roof on the building in the middle of the winter, the, uh, hanging sheetrock and piping and all those pieces. They're the ultimate unsung heroes, because it's easy for us to create the vision that we wanted to have for these buildings, but it's those worker bees that we couldn't cel celebrate enough. So, you know, we were bringing coffee and donuts and holding doors open for them. Um, and I would th share with you at, at the ribbon cutting ceremonies in the future, the people that should be in the front row is the plumber, the heating and air conditioning guy, the drywall guy, all those folks that literally took our vision and made it happen in the field. And I, I couldn't begin to um, salute them more than I just, um, in, in all of them, because we give them impossible schedules and, you know, the, see the Southway folks here, and they, they can really appreciate those kinds of pieces that say it's, you know, we sit in those trailers and it's nice and comfortable, and the folks that are actually building the space are the ones that need to be applauded and need to be sitting in, front, in the front row in these, um, in these ribbon cutting ceremonies. I, I, uh... I, I don't think we also properly described the scene of what you know Miller's Court looked like when we first went down there. And George Mister's here, and we, we brought down all our most trusted advisors to tour them through this collapsing 150-year-old building to get their opinion. And right. every one of them told us that we were crazy, right. and 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 that it was a terrible idea. Um, t tell the story about bringing mom down. So I, we, Tebow and I both made a conscious decision that we were not going to tell our wives about it until after we bought the building. <laughs> figured that it's easier to ask for forgiveness and permission. <laughs> so I take Brigitte down and we're walking through this building and the pigeons are flying all over the place. There's, you know, water's coming in from all kinds of places and places, graffiti, the, the, art, the artwork on the graffiti was just exceptional. Most of it PG rated. Um, and so Brigitte's absolutely, totally silent through the entire walkthrough. For three days, she won't talk to me. <laughs> and finally she turns to me and she says, We've been married for, at that point in time, for 30 years. She says, this is the dumbest thing <laughs> that you've ever done. The building gets completed. It's, it looks like a, it, it looks just amazing. And Brigitte takes full credit <laughs> for it. So I've, you know, and we've, la and we've lasted another 10 years of the marriage, no problem. This present's for her. <laughs> exactly, exactly right. So, uh, um, so um, none of us anticipated the success of Miller's Court, and we were asked to, to replicate the, the building across the country, and we've done right. more buildings in Baltimore, focused on teachers and nonprofits, and some other cities as well. Um, uh, what we never saw come in was the movement that got created in Remington. Um, can you tell us about um, how the for sale housing? Uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn that to you, because that's. <laughs> You, you can tell that story equally as well, and because beca we became so friendly with those teachers, so I want to let you do that. Yeah, I want you to tell the story. Um, so uh, we, we were we were doing all these cookouts. Uh, um, we we're a lot younger then too, and didn't have to respond to the kids and rest <laughs> right. But we would do cookouts, and we'd, if there was a nice Friday afternoon, we'd buy a keg and put it in the courtyard and. Send an email out. To this them. wasn't for Seawall folks. <laughs> this was for the people in the building. And uh, and the teachers would all gather up, and, and it was a Friday, and we were beautiful spring day, and uh, um, five couples surrounded us and said, um, uh, "We're all in. 
Um, as a result of this building, we want to stay in the classroom. Uh, we want to stay in Baltimore, um, and we want to make uh, and we want to buy a house, which was three of our mo most important goals when we set oh, out yeah. with it. Um, and they said that they want that house to be in the neighborhood of Remington, and they want us to build the house for them. So the first three ideas were amazing, right? We, <laughs> exactly we, what we hoped for. Right. The last two we didn't didn't make a lot of sense to us. You know, we didn't understand, didn't know how to build a house, and we didn't. No, uh, um, we didn't, were surprised that someone would permanently want to live in, in that neighborhood at the time. And they said, you're missing the point. Um, uh, look around us. There's 30 vacant homes that are surrounding this building. There's drug dealing going on out of them. There's, uh, there's slumlords, and it's just it's a bad situation. And this investment that we all made, they said, is never going to materialize um, if we don't start to fix up the rest of the community. Um, and at least chip in for it. Um, and they challenged us. They said, if, if you guys go out and buy those 30 homes, we'll buy them back from you. Um, it'll be a partnership. And so I think we went out and talked about it that night. We probably had a few beers. And, uh, and they were right. Um, and so over the course of the next 30 days, we went out and bought every single home that they had pointed to. We bought out slumlords for more money than they deserved. Uh, the city gave us homes for a dollar because nobody else wanted them. And we overpaid for those homes we paid, bought for a dollar. <laughs> That's right. Um, and we called those five couples back and said, you guys are in trouble because we're in trouble. <laughs> we just bought these houses. You have to buy them back from us. And right. we started the process of building from the inside out, um, where um, uh, we uh, hosted a focus group with probably 10 or 15 people and a small design team in the basement of this collapsing row home. Um, I think we sat in the basement because that was the most stable of the floors. <laughs> uh, we brought pizza and beers and we asked those teachers to dream big and reinvent the experience you could have both from the inside and the outside of the house. So they took up our plans, which we thought were great. They ripped them up and they literally started from scratch and they wanted to make a statement from the outside of the house as well from, from the inside of the house. Uh, so we took their plans and we designed them uh, to put them into, uh, got permit set of plans and figured out how to build a model home because we had to sell 30 of them. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we hosted an open house. It was probably four, four Octobers ago. Yeah. And uh, we were expecting 15 or 20 families to show up to that open house. And 300 people showed up, and all 30 of the homes sold within the first hour. Um, uh, and that, that, you know, that, that, that was our reaction. We couldn't believe what had just happened. Um, and uh, you know, from that point on, we became really aware of the movement that was starting um, uh, in the, the neighborhood of Remington and that through deep listening, you know, we could really help both the end user and the community realize their, their dream. And realize their goals and aspirations for their communities. I mean, you wouldn't walk your dog from, when we bought at the Miller's Court building, you wouldn't walk your dog from the corner of Howard and 26th Street to Howard and Maryland Avenue. The, the CS, there were CSX trains run underneath that portion of, and there were two lots there that we ended up uh, uh, leasing from um, uh, CSX. Not because we had to, because we had enough parking according to zoning, but the neighborhood was particularly concerned about parking and the overflow on the streets, et cetera, and so we cut a deal with those guys. And, but the illicit behavior that was going on on those lots was just indescribable. And so, the, you know, so we've been able to fix up these lots, but people now literally walk their dogs all through the neighborhood. They're pushing baby carriages, so there's a whole new sense of young people moving into the neighborhood. Uh, and they all feel like they're taking responsibility for the success of, of, of where they live and what they want for the future. And they've been a part of strategic planning processes with us. We've been a part of strategic planning processes with them because the heart and soul of Baltimore is its communities. And to the extent that they ha are empowered and have capacity to perform for themselves, just it's it's just it spirals with um, with with good good end results. Um, so again, part of this is is it isn't about us. The real estate literally is the means to the end, and the end for those teachers new to the city, the nonprofits, um, uh, the the community as a whole, those those young folks that have moved into houses. So. Um, so we've, the other, one of the other pieces that Tibo and I talked about often and is that we didn't want to see be, be one-off developers in, in the community. And so as we continued to move forward, we looked around for other kind of opportunities within Remington to make a difference. And so that took us sort of to Remington Row in our house. And I thought you could sort of talk about how we quietly for a while assembled, uh, assembled the properties and then 
we had the last person to go deal with who had heard about all the things that were going on prior to it. So. so, so I think we've always been very clear that nothing we've ever done has been our idea. Right. You know, from helping Joe Jones and the Center for Urban Families, from helping the teachers and the nonprofits realize their dreams, um, from helping uh, now Mayor Pugh uh, with the with the design school. Um, uh, and uh, the neighborhood of Remington had come up, been working really hard on this master plan where they wanted to take three or four contiguous blocks of underutilized abandoned old industrial space, literally at the heart of the community, and turn it into this urban, walkable, mixed use boulevard with shops and restaurants and little retail on the first floor, which there was none of in the community. Right. Um, an office component to bring more activity during the day, and then you know, multifamily component. Um, and they had set out these, these three blocks uh, along Remington Avenue. And then we got a hold of the plan. And I don't know that they ever thought that it'd be a possible, impossible to assemble all of it and do it as, in, all at once. It was, had to have been 20 properties uh, and 20 different owners. And uh, you know, we decided that we were going to help, really help the neighborhood realize their dreams. And we kind of went out and assembled uh, uh, all of the properties. And we called the community into one of these so these uh, open meetings that, that we'd have any time we wanted to kick an idea around. And we asked them about their plan and really what their intentions were and what would they do if they owned all of all three blocks. And, and they got really excited and really d dove deeper into the plan. And we said, well, you do own those three or four blocks now because we've assembled it. And let's really dig in and figure out right. what it can become. Um, and so we worked with them on that. And, and it was an enormous project. Uh, you know. Miller's Court, which was big at the time at $20 million, right. talking about $100 million of development uh, um, almost uh, overnight. And we understood that uh, that was a major thing for a little community to swallow. So um, every single night for six months, uh, uh, we went door to door um, to uh, all of the homes that surrounded the, the neighbor in the building. Right. We sat on stoops, as you talked about. We sat in living rooms. And we just listened. Um, we asked them what the impact of a project like this would have, if it was something that they thought that they would welcome, um, if it came to fruition, what they thought was missing. And we were taking notes and scribbling the whole time. We must have met with three or 400 people um, and really intimately got to know the, the, the folks, even past just the neighborhood associations. And it was an amazing thing to uh, have gone through that and to have really listened to it. Because what you had is that everybody was able to put a face to um, uh, all the activity that right. was going to start to take place. And it wasn't just the new folks that were moving in. It was the folks that had lived there for generations right. that really felt like they had a seat at the table. Um, and you know, slowly but, slowly but surely, uh, um, the, the first phase, Remington Row, came to be. Um, which was built by Southway. I've seen a bunch of those guys here, and uh, all the all the finance and teams uh, um, coming together for it as well. Um, and then the, the second phase was the uh, um, uh, was up the at the Anderson Body Shop for our house. And so uh, the the idea was that all these chefs had come in and seen what Spike had done at Parts and Labor, and seen what Clavel, what Lane had done in Clavel, and they knew that restaurants could work in Remington, but they didn't have a million dollars to put into the build out. And they asked us to do for them what we had done for teachers, which was put everybody under one roof um, and have them uh, um, share ideas and collaborate and help each other out and cry together and laugh together. Um, and it turned into uh, the idea of a launch pad for Baltimore's most exciting chefs. You know, we weren't building a food hall. We weren't building a restaurant. We were building a launch pad to create jobs and to help folks. I've seen uh, uh, Federico from White Envelope, who's one of the, the great tenants up uh, I'm um, doing Venezuelan street food. Um, and l again, started the concept of building from the inside out. We had focus groups with the community. We were about to bring a million people into the neighborhood on, a, on, a daily, on, a, on an annual basis. That was going to be a major shock. How did they see this? How could we help to make sure that it worked for them? How could we make sure that the chefs designed every square inch, not only of their own space, but of the common space? How could you reinvent the experience you had when right. you came into one of these type of places? Right. Um, and, uh, and you know, opened our doors to, to uh, our house uh, fully leased about three months ago right. and kind of off to the races. Let me um, add a couple of stories to that. Um, so one of the most emotional things I can ever remember in these last 10 years, 
Um, Thibault's describing the sort of sitting on the stoops in the living rooms and getting buy-in from the community because this is something that we want. This, these are the pieces we need. We had one, the last city council piece to go through in order to get final approval for the PUD. 30 of the residents showed up to um, talk on our behalf at 3 in the afternoon. So they, obviously they, they left work, the majority of them, to come and share their experiences. And almost each one of them, the piece that most stood out for them was that they felt they were included in the design process and the final, the final piece of how the, how the project actually was going to unfold. I mean, it literally brought tears to our eyes that, you know, that we couldn't imagine doing it any other way. It just wasn't, it just was, it just was our, our mantra in terms of how we were going to conduct our business. It, this, it was for those folks that were, we were building for were the people that were ultimately going to be the neighbors. But for 30 individuals to show up and testify was maybe the most emotional thing that I can re remember seeing. And the other piece that I think was really important is it was the Remington Road projects were the first time that we needed outside investors. Um, all the other projects we've done, we've done with sort of new market tax credits and soft city loans, and so we didn't have need for outside investors. And so Thibault and I talked a lot about how we were going to find these outside investors. Um, and so we went to the real estate investment trusts, and all of which had real interest in the project, thought this was really the right thing to invest in, but they ultimately wanted to have sort of the last say in decisions. Um, and then we got into a conversation about talking to some of the folks that have made Baltimore their home, have done incredibly well and been incredibly successful um, about being investors in this project. And so we made this list of folks and that we'd known for a long period of time uh, and went to see each of them and described to them. And they'd known about the projects that we'd done up until then. And the buy-in was exceptional, in large part because they got two returns. They got a, a reasonable economic return on their investment, but they felt like this was something they were doing for their children and their grandchildren, that they, were, they could drive by and point to a neighborhood that said, here's the, an old industrial buildings that are vacant, and what's going to be built here is going to be something that's really designed and been thoughtful about the for the community. So they, there was, there was a, a greater social return on their investment for themselves because they wanted Baltimore to be a, the great city that they, that they built their own businesses in. Um, but they also wanted to be able to say to their family that here's something that's really important for us to be proud of, that we've been able to make a difference where there was no investment. We made a conscious decision to be uh, investors. So I don't know, I'd, when we walked those folks through the, through the project and the, um, the ones particularly on Remington, Remington Avenue, I mean, they've been so taken because we've literally taken them through when the buildings were in their formative stage, and then when the buildings got open, they just were incredibly taken by the fact that they really saw their investment as something more than just the economic value that it had. So, one of the things that we skipped over was uh, um, uh, the property management side of what we do. Um, uh, the conversation started early when we were about to finish a building and had to get somebody to manage it for us. Can you, uh, can you tell us about that? We made lots of mis we made two or three mistakes in terms of who we hired because we hired people who were property managers, with all due respect for the profession, um, because they this is how they this is how they grew up learning about property management. It wasn't about the relationship; it was about the transaction, and so we made those two early on mistakes, uh, and then we really and it's true for of the dozen folks that work in the company, maybe two of them have real estate experience. Because um, I really grew up, even in, in my days in Columbia, we hired school teachers and uh, folks that were in totally unrelated businesses who just understood that the, what we were doing was different than just leasing space. And so they came to it because they were in, in businesses where the relationship was more important than the transaction. Um, and so we really went out and, and have found a, an incredible group of rock stars who really believe that what we're doing is something different than just uh, managing buildings or lease, leasing space. We're building community within the building. Um, they're organizing brown bag lunches uh, for the tenants in the building to bring smart people to the nonprofits to help them get smarter at what they're doing. Uh, the property managers host um, uh, breakfasts two or three times a year as they get off the elevator 
uh, for the teachers um, to be able to have them to, to be able to celebrate the important work that they um, they do. They they figured out how to house the the CEO of the Baltimore City Public Schools uh, for a dinner, and we invited the you know 40, 50 teachers that are in our building to have dinner with the CEO of the school system. As meaningful it was for her, for those teachers to be in the same room to be able to share those experiences. So. The property management, there are obviously the pieces about collecting rent and paying debt service and all those pieces, but the real success is that, the, that the, those folks in the building, those residents um, and the chefs um, really feel like there's a community here that we're responsible to build. Do you know the John bike story? No, you share that one. So, so, so uh, you guys might know John Constable, who's one of the greatest human beings on the planet. Um, so he was our first real hire for the project, and we said, reinvent what it means to be a, a, a property management company. And so he got to know all of the tenants intimately, all these teachers moving into Baltimore for the first time. And he got a call from this one teacher who was going to school and he's like, oh, I just made this huge investment. I bought my first real bike and it was, uh, it was a couple thousand dollars and I'm, I'm, it's gonna get delivered but I'm gonna be at school. I wanna make sure like, no, the box doesn't get mixed up. Can you take the box and keep it in your office and I'll come get it from you after, uh, after school? So John says, yeah, I got you, I got you, no problem. So the box comes, and John's a bit of a biker himself, and he's staring at a procrastinator too, and he's staring at the box like for an hour, and he's like, I can do this. So he goes up to the kid's apartment, and he sits there for three or four hours, and he builds the guy's bike, he literally assembles it. <laughs> and he, uh, he finishes it, and he puts a little note on it, uh, and I think he went and got a, like a bottle of wine or something and said, you know, you know, please uh, bike responsibly and wear a helmet. Um, uh, and the kid comes home from like probably the hardest day of, of the year in the classroom where he's just getting crushed and there's this assembled bike with a note from John. Um, and, and, you know, we could tell a hundred John stories and right. Sean stories and David stories, but the idea was to reinvent the expectation of what it means to be a partner Right. with the folks that are, um, are giving us the honor to, to help provide them great space. The other piece that we've learned about people is that we, wanna, we want them to use what's highest and best use of their time. And for John, it was like building bicycles and doing those things beyond the call of duty and exceeding expectations. Um, and so what John wasn't really good at was the administration side of it. As, at as much time as we spent with him to tell him about the importance of doing updating all the data and financial information, you just, you just couldn't get it. And so the smartest thing we finally said is, look, you do what you do really well. Go out there and, and make friends with all these tenants, and we're going to hire somebody who has no interest <laughs> in, in, do it, in, in building bicycles that's just going to get up and just going to process paper, and the relationship has been exceptional. So part of it is recognizing what the highest and best use of people's time is, um, and then making sure that, that you're surrounded by really smart people who can help you get things, get things done, so. Um, we've, we've got a, a couple minutes left. Um, uh, I'm gonna, gonna ask you a, a question, but uh, um, uh, I think, you know, in, in, in closing for me, uh, what's been amazing and what you've taught us is that we are not real estate developers. Right. You know, we, we are social entrepreneurs that just happen to use the built environment to help make neighborhoods great places. Our role is to provide spectacular space for the people doing the most important work, the most creative work in our cities, so they can thrive. Um, but at no point in time did we ever look at ourselves as developers. We actually might be in the wrong department uh, for this, uh, this, this evening here. Um, and you've, without ever telling us that, helped us understand, all of us that, you know, this younger generation uh, have helped us understand the importance of reinventing industry so that our purpose is more important than our product. And right. Thank you for that. Well, um, I, I can't, I mean, I, as I said, the first 25 years of my ex business experience was exceptional, the two years at the school system. These 10 years to be surrounded, I mean, I, I often tell people I'm the senior member of Seawall only by age. Um, it's it's the energy that's in the in the in the within those folks. The fact that they really see themselves in doing something for a higher purpose than just re renting apartments. I mean, Sean Brown spent the first month of her time with us visiting all the other developments in Baltimore as if she was going to rent an apartment. 
so that she could learn what those folks were doing really well and what they weren't doing really well so that she could model what she was doing. She doesn't believe for a moment that she's renting apartments. She absolutely she believes she's creating community within the building. And she's doing all kinds of things to be able to do that. And so I think, as I sort of think back on what my father surely taught us by, by not, again, by not sitting us down in the classroom and telling us this is how you do it, but by his actions, was it, it's a business about relationships. It's about listening first um, and implementing and exceeding expectations for those people that we're engaged with. And the, the outcomes for those are relationships that we couldn't possibly have imagined uh, both with neighborhoods and um, the individuals that are a part of our buildings. And so I'm, I promise you, despite all of the issues that we confront on a daily basis, the, the smile on our faces when we go to sleep at night is literally from ear to ear. I can't imagine, can't imagine it being anything else other than that. And then to have those folks that have surrounded us to, be, to give us the success that the buildings have had and the... Uh, the neighborhoods have had have been just spectacular. And I, I, my greatest vision now is to begin to figure out how to do these in, in, in neighborhoods within Baltimore that have been lost and disinvested in for decades now. And how do you begin the same, bring the same sort of vibrancy to, to some of these neighborhoods? I went to a dinner at Hopkins last night and drove across Biddle Street from President Street getting off the expressway. I can't imagine how any of us sitting in this room can let those long vacant houses be there. It's just, it's, I, can't, I can't figure out. I and mean, it's not like they've been vacant for a week. <laughs> you know, they've been like for years. And so, and every once in a while you'll see one house that looks like it's lived in and all the other nine houses that surround it are, you know, see-through houses. Um, so I'm, I'm encouraged on lots of reasons, um, but I'd say in terms of the pieces that you've been able to terms in terms of leading the, the seawall mission is that you've taken all those things genetically and, and cast a shadow um, uh, across the neighborhood of Remington and um, that's just, it's been second to none. So I'm, you know, as a, as a parent and as the grandparent, I, I think that what you've been able to be able to do for yourself, for the seawall folks and for your children and your wife is just exceptional. Donald Tebow, thank you very much. And I'm always amazed at how fast this hour goes. Um, can we have the thank house lights up, please? Now, we do have a couple minutes left. Are there any questions from the audience that you would like to ask our guests? Dave? That was amazing. I only wish there was like another whole hour. I love hearing the stories. I love hearing the passion. Uh, the sincerity of what you do is, is so, uh, it's, it's so incredible. So here, here's a question. You know, the success of what's going on in Remington, you see this a lot of times in communities that your own success sometimes creates missed opportunities for folks of lesser means that they feel like they can't be a part of what's going on. And not by your own doing, it's just, the nature of, you know, gentrification that takes place. Do you, the, kind of moving forward and looking at other communities, do you sometimes think about that piece of the puzzle, uh, the affordability part? You, you're so good at the, for teachers and the nonprofits, and just wondering if you've learned something that might be able to carry over into uh, housing. So, uh, d d Dave, you're sitting next to the, my other mentor and hero, who I, Josh, and uh, the, 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 the two of you guys have been so spectacular to let us pick up the phone and call and bounce ideas off you guys. I, I love you, man. Um, uh, it's a, we just had our 10-year anniversary at Seawall, um, and uh, it was two of us, and in that room, uh, 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 10 years ago, and, it, and it, 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 there was probably almost 20 people this year, um, and we didn't know where everybody came from. Um, but, you know, we've done, 250 million dollars worth of projects over those 10 years, which is 249 million dollars more than we thought we would do when we started the company. Um, and we never talked about it once during the strategic planning meeting with had. We never talked about doing 500 million dollars over the next 20 years. We spent the majority of the meeting 
figuring out how nobody who lived in the neighborhood of Remington would ever be displaced, um, and how our role of this unexpected success of the projects of Remington, um, uh, there were, that, that, that we were starting to see detrimental consequences as a result of it. And if we didn't help out, then it would get even worse. So as a result of our uh, um, really working for the community, we've been involved in these amazing conversations of how do we create land trusts so that people can, uh, can so there can be permanent affordability in homes. Um, how do we make sure that the folks that have lived there forever really understand that they have a seat at the table and they're, they're driving the, 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 the process forward? This is, we work for them. Um, and it was a total, uh, uh, um, uh, we, we reminded ourselves of that deeply and spent the majority of that strategic planning meeting thinking about how we were going to really implement that and, uh, and make sure that what you're talking about, this gentrification piece, didn't happen and that the people who lived, lived there forever and that the people who were just moving in were equally as proud of what had taken place and what was to take place. Um, so the model for that is, is, it is, and as we go to other communities and as others go to other communities, is understanding that up front. Had we understood it earlier, we could have probably bought more, uh, uh, or helped others buy more places before the, the prices skyrocketed as they, as they have. But it's, we're all in this together, you know? So it's, it's high fives throughout the neighborhood, uh, um, uh, thinking about how um, we're gonna plan for the future with everybody in mind. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Oh, no. no. <laughs> next, next question. Anybody else? <laughs> You're not going to give a sermon, are you? No, sir. Okay, okay sir. Maybe a benediction, but not a sermon. <laughs> uh, a question, uh, David Bowers from Enterprise. Question, there are a lot of developers in a lot of towns who are not mission-driven in the way that you all are. So I'm curious if you've had conversations with Folks, I know you're social entrepreneurs, not real estate developers, but have you had conversations with for-profit developers and shared how you've done well by doing good, and shared your approach, and see whether or not you've been able to get any sort of feedback from them that might change their approach so that they're not strictly driven by maximizing profit, but the ability to do some good development, engage with people the way you described, and still make a nice living. Um, so we, um, Teach for America asked us if we would um, consider this model of Centers for Educational Excellence in other cities and they identified Philadelphia, Washington and New Orleans as the three cities that we ought to get focused on and so we chose Philadelphia first and, um, and we made a conscious decision that we weren't going to go up there and set up an office and try to figure out the landscape in Philadelphia and so we found two folks that looked a lot like Tebow and more, they looked more like Tebow than looked like me. Um, and, but they had the same bent. They had been developers who had been doing some high-end stuff, but they really were missing something. They're missing the sort of the soul of it. And so together, you know, they were our partner in Philadelphia, and they spent each day working on the project with us. Uh, they managed the project, and, but their first meeting in when we bought the buildings up there with them was to go sit in front of the neighborhood association and give them their vision. So there was this immediate need to be able to be uh, partnering with those important people that surrounded the project. And they have taken the same attitude towards that project that it isn't just, it isn't just the building itself, it's, it's the folks that are in the building and creating that community and then having the community itself feel like that they're uh, that, they, that they have an ownership position in the success of the project. We probably have been spoken to maybe a dozen different cities around the country who have come to us with the same sort of concept and have picked our brains about it. In each case, we're describing the same scenario. If you're going to really do this well, do it because you're, you want to do it from the soul of the neighborhood and not from the, your pocketbook. Is it? And, you know, that's been incredibly ex well accepted. We had some folks came down from Portland, Maine, spent a day maybe six weeks or so ago because they wanted to create a food court because they'd heard about what we're doing. And, you know, so they're trying to pick up those same ideas about how to launch something like this and have it be, have it's okay to make money at it, but it's okay also, more importantly, to be able to fill a need in the, in the neighborhood and in, in the city itself.
And, 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 and David, we're, we're not sitting here if it's not for you guys, man. So we, right. we, we love you guys. Uh, but I'm looking at, jo at Josh and Ernst, and um, and and that there's there's we have a responsibility, uh, and it's going to be the younger generation that's going to do this. We're gonna we're gonna all, sooner than we know it, we're only going to start companies to, to 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 serve a purpose, a social purpose, right? We're going to we have an outstanding product, but the social purpose is going to be the things that we focus on primarily, and it's a it's a it's a it's a huge shift in mentality. But we're all going to realize that when you focus on that social purpose first, the product is going to be that much stronger because that's just the way that our world is starting to think. So uh, I think organically that's going to start to happen. Is that uh, um, you're going to have so many more of these companies not looking at themselves as developers or retailers or grocers or whatever. They're, you know, social entrepreneurs who are using great pro product to help really f selfishly f uh, fulfill their social purpose, which is what you guys are all about, David. There's a spectacular book written by the found co-founder of uh, Whole Foods. It's called Conscious Capitalism. If you, don't, if you don't read anything else, read that book. It's, it's, it really speaks to all the pieces that, that we've been sharing this evening. Um, uh, and, it's, it, and it's really written from him telling stories um, about their experiences and the p companies that he's known over time and how they've responded. It is, it is okay to be a capitalist. If you're a capitalist with a soul and a higher purpose, you, that, you'll, you'll do that much better over the long, over the long haul. All right, how about one final question? Let's have one from a student. I know you're here. I will call you guys out. I, I, I did, let's do, if it's more than one student, let's. Yes, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Um, so currently, I am working on a project for a real estate market analysis class regarding the state center development. The state and what? State uh, center right. development. And um, as you know, that's recently been spread by the governor. What do you feel are the consequences of that area not being developed in an inclusive way that includes the residents that have been there for decades and that's ultimately going to impact the surrounding nine neighborhoods? Uh, uh, been we got we right there. <laughs> you want to get that one? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Caroline? Well, I, I need to clarify, uh, to understand your question, is it really about the fact that if it's not done the way it's been envisioned over the last year, 11 years, yeah. and, and the governor just comes in and does an arena, yeah. for example? Well, that would be a travesty <laughs> on, on all kinds of levels, because the state started the project under the Ehrlich administration with this great vision that went from Pennsylvania Avenue to Penn State. And they're the ones that started bringing all of the communities together and all of the churches together and, and really picked our team because we didn't have a plan. We had a process that included all the stakeholders to get to a plan, but, the, but as you so articulately described, it was really about servicing those neighborhoods and to get to the point where, you know, after 11 years and 16 contracts and a community benefits agreement, economic inclusion plan, and fighting, <laughs> fighting a horrible, um, ridiculous lawsuit and winning, um, to have the, the state who initiated it, all of this great work, they even won an award for it, nothing's even been built yet. <laughs> That's a great um, urban mixed use project. Um, to kind of just say, well, we don't want to do that, but we want to do a mixed use project. It's kind of like, well, what do you want to do? I mean, this is, you started it, the community has, has dreamt this up. There's been so much time and money invested. You gotta just kind of scratch your head and say, what, what would replace this? Right. It rings every bell you know, that you could possibly imagine. So, I don't want to, you know, if you, if, I, I can't say, I think it would be a travesty of time and money and commitment and, and hope. So is there another question somebody in the audience can answer? 
<laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, we are past our time. Uh, if you guys want to stick around and talk to the students, if you, if you have a moment, students, if you want to come up and ask questions you didn't get to, we can certainly do that. But I would like to thank everybody for coming. Thank you, Donald and Tebow, for your thank time. You. Thanks once again to all of our event sponsors. Uh, have a great night. We'll see you at the next one.